Today's show is all about hurricanes. I got an opportunity to fly right through the eye of Hurricane Florence with the Hurricane Hunters. Beth didn't have an opportunity to go along, so I brought her here to the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. Right behind me is the Curtain Wall Test Chamber. Here at the museum, they use it to learn about high winds and skyscrapers. Beth's inside to experience 100 mile an hour winds, like you might find in a hurricane. Beth, are you ready? Let's crank it up! is one giant ball of energy trying to equalize itself. It's super cold at the poles and really hot at the equator. Trying to strike that balance is what causes weather. And that's why we're here in New York. We're gonna be heading inside to ABC News to talk with Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z. Come along. Well, hi, Marty. Hi, Beth. Welcome to ABC. What can I do for you? Ginger, thank you so much for hosting us here today. Mm -hmm. We are learning all about hurricanes, and we know you are an expert on these storms. Can you tell us what exactly is a hurricane? I think it's a question a lot of people have because they don't know the difference maybe between a tornado and a hurricane. A hurricane happens over the ocean. It needs water. Most of them that we see eventually hit land happen and start as a group of thunderstorms off the west coast of Africa. So a hurricane essentially is a group of thunderstorms that becomes organized, that uses the Coriolis effect or the rotation of our Earth to start rotating, becoming more organized, then feeds off of the temperature of the ocean. They need 79 to 80 degrees or higher. So they're looking for that for fuel. Then they are fueling themselves in part by kind of moving through the motions of evaporation and cooling and all of the different you know scientific things I could go into. <laughs> but overall, that group of thunderstorms becomes a self-fueling uh, entity. And basically, as long as it doesn't have wind shear, cutting it off at the top, it will keep rotating. This column of low pressure at the base, high pressure up top. You've been on the ground in the middle of a hurricane. Mm. What is that like? Oh, it is uh, stunning, actually. Each time I'm in a hurricane, and I've been in several, from Katrina through Sandy, um, and most recently in Michael, there you can see anything from tornadoes in the outer bands to the flash flooding that can happen, the regular flooding that can happen within those bands. You can obviously have the very strong winds, like in Michael, Panama City was shredded, but I was in Mexico Beach and I was witnessing the worst of a hurricane, the thing that causes the most loss of life and property, and that's storm surge, where water actually bubbles up on the ocean with that pressure, by the way, rushes toward the, the coast and takes out. I watched a home a really well-built home, twist off of its foundation, roll down the road, and then be shredded on another building. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about how the air pressure works in mm -hmm. these storms? Right. So it is essentially a group of a low pressure system. I mean, it's a tropical wave when it starts. So it's just low. And then up top, though, pressure has to be high. You cannot have also low pressure up there because you can't have that wind shear. So basically the low pressure, again, can bubble up that water. You actually, if you were able to see it, it would raise the water. Wow. wow. Well, let's learn a little bit more about air pressure with our science correspondent, Shauna. Hi, I'm Shauna Edson and we are at Sterling Middle School. Yeah! And today we are talking about air pressure. Y'all want to see a really cool demo about air pressure? Yeah! All right, so here's what we're going to do. I have a pie plate. It's got some water in it. We have a candle. We're going to light the candle, and then we're going to take this glass vase, and we're going to put it over the top. What do y'all think is going to happen when we do that? The fire's going to get stuck in the cup. Yeah, so the candle's going to go out? All right, 
You got some hypotheses? Let's go try it. Let's get a bigger candle because we can really see this effect. All right, so first thing we need to do is light the candle. Can you do that for us? Awesome, thank you. Now, can you place this over the top of our candle? Yep. And let's watch what happens. Okay. So as the candle's burning here, it's heating up that air and it's increasing the pressure inside the vase. And we saw those bubbles escape when we put the vase down. But now, as the candle is burning out, it's no longer heating that air. That air contracts, the air pressure goes down inside the vase and it pulls that water up into that low pressure area. Awesome, thanks guys. Back to you, Beth and Marty. So, Marty, I've done a lot of being in a hurricane on the ground, but you flew into a hurricane? I did. I got an opportunity to fly with the hurricane hunters through the eye of Hurricane Florence, and it was incredible. The 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron of the United States Air Force Reserve, or the Hurricane Hunters, gather crucial data to keep us safe. They do this by flying into hurricanes. And how far are we from the eye? As Hurricane Florence grew in strength, I flew to Savannah, Georgia to meet up with the hurricane hunters. I only got a few hours sleep before heading out to the airfield at two in the morning. These are no regular airplanes. These are modified C-130s that fly directly into the eye wall of the storm. I'd never flown on a C-130 before, so I wasn't sure what to expect. It's not comfortable. You're sitting on a mesh bench along the wall, flying sideways. It was very different from a commercial flight in that you don't have any visual cues about where you are or when you're about to take off. Once in the air, the wait began. We had at least six hours just to get to Hurricane Florence. So uh, we're heading uh, towards uh, Hurricane Florence right now. Uh, we're going to uh, enter from the northwest and we're going to go through the eye and we're going to fix the exact location on where the eye is at. So I'm acting as uh, the mission director here, so my job is to collect all the data, uh, quality check it, make sure it's as accurate as possible. Um, I have a chat up right here with the National Hurricane Center, so I can keep them in the loop what we're seeing and then uh, send them my information. Um, real time, so within 10 minutes we'll have the, uh, the information we're gathering. In the meantime, we're going to be collecting data uh, horizontally and then also using drop sonds to collect uh, data in the vertical. Pretty much we're going to try to cut through all four quadrants of the hurricane and uh, go through the eye two times to uh, find the location. We were about to fly through the eye of a Category 4 hurricane. Everybody on board seems a little bit nervous right now, except for the crew. They are uh, raring to go. And it's kind of cool seeing how calm they are. It makes everybody else calm, too. There were no seats in the cockpit, so I was standing there bracing myself. As we got close to the eye, we couldn't see anything out of the windows, and it was getting bumpier. I looked out the window and could barely see the propeller, and it wasn't that far away. The pilot told us to hold on. We were about to punch through the eye wall. We were suddenly in blue skies. We could see white caps on the ocean below, perfectly blue skies above, and clouds all around us. Once in the eye, we made several turns to deploy the drop sons.
Suddenly there was a huge circular rainbow right in front of us. Then the pilots told us to hold on because we were going back out. These are no ordinary airmen. These are the hurricane hunters. They take their mission very seriously. Everyone from the pilots, to the weather officers, to the maintenance crew, work really hard to keep people safe. Bottom line, the crew was amazing and we brought back some really important data. Ginger, Marty talks about this data, but do you think it's really worth it to fly a plane into a hurricane to collect this kind of data? It's not just worth it, it's critical. I mean, that's how we get the information that we have to give people. When I'm on television, I'm waiting for those drop signs, those, the information <laughs> that comes from the hurricane hunter. I, we are refreshing, refreshing the screen until that new info comes in because that's going to help drive our forecast, the computer models. All of it really comes from the combination of satellite plus that data. What are the winds like inside a hurricane? Oh, the winds inside a hurricane can be as simple as a tropical storm could have, you know, the 40 mile per hour wind or so. But when you get upwards of 140 miles per hour, like we saw in Michael, that type of wind, think about it. A lot of tornadoes aren't even that strong. And think of the damage they can do. Now you're doing that on a much wider scale. You can have a 60 or 100 mile wide path of destruction just from that part of the eye wall, the part where the, the worst of the winds are. So the winds are a huge part, but I do like to emphasize, and we've learned this a lot the last couple of years with these different types of storms, wind isn't everything, right? So you can't just say, oh, it's a category three, that's how much wind is within the, right? You have to look at the other impacts, and that would be how much rain falls, because we saw that with Harvey, we saw it with Florence, <laughs> and then how much storm surge. Well, let's go back to our science correspondent, Shauna, and she's going to talk a little bit more about air pressure and wind. We've talked about air pressure. Now we're going to look at how it's related to wind. So, guys, what is wind? It moves. What's moving? The air. The air, right? Wind is air that's moving. So it blows, it hits us, we feel it. Wind is air that moves. But what causes the wind? What pushes it? Air pressure. Air pressure, exactly. Because push was the key word. If you were to push on my hand, you're putting pressure, right? Yeah. So it is air pressure that causes the air to move and make the wind that we feel. So we're going to demonstrate how that works because it's really differences in air pressure. So we're using height to show air pressure. So this big stack of books, this is a high pressure area. The smaller stack of books, this is a lower pressure area. So if this is an air molecule, what's going to happen if we put it in between the high and low pressure areas? It's going to go down. It's going to go down, right? OK, let's try that. OK, so the air went from the high to the low pressure. And that makes sense, right? Things get pushed by high pressure, and they want to go to areas of low pressure. So the difference in pressure is about this much. So that would be kind of a normal day. This kind of a wind might be a soft breeze, maybe 10 miles per hour. But when is our time when it's windier? It'll go, it gets really windy outside. Yeah. And what do we call it when it gets really windy outside? Storm. A storm, yeah. And storms form when there's lower air pressure. So we're going to show that. Can you two take those books and put them behind us? Thank you. All right, so now we have a lower pressure zone over here, but this is the same. So now we've got a difference of this much. So what's going to happen to our air molecule now? It's going to go faster. Can you put it in there for us? All right, so with a bigger difference in air pressure, that air molecule went flying a lot faster. So in a storm with a big pressure difference, you can get winds of 40 or 50 miles an hour. So that might break tree branches. We really feel that. OK, what's, what's the, like, the most intense kind of storm you can think of? Hurricane. Hurricane, right? Hurricanes have crazy low pressure in the middle. So let's do that. Can you take this and put it on the ground there for me? Thank you. And can you come hold this? Awesome. OK. So with this crazy difference in air pressure, what's going to happen to our air molecule? It's going to go down faster. Yeah. All right. Can you put it in there for us? 
Whoa. Whoa. It flew right out of the bowl. OK, so with a hurricane, with this crazy difference in air pressure, this is how you can get 70, 80, 100 mile per hour winds or more because there's this really huge difference in air pressure. So the next time you're walking around on a windy day, you can say to your friends, my, there's a big difference in air pressure today. You guys gonna do that? Yes. yes. Back to you, Marty and Beth. Ginger, I know that meteorologists use a lot of different tools, and one of them is satellites. Yes. You wanna tell us a little bit how you use that information? Satellites have changed the entire world of weather. I mean, in the 60s, we really started to be able to witness what was happening from above our Earth, and that changed how we forecast, because we could finally see it. You need an observation to see it, and we didn't have that over the ocean. Now we can see the whole Earth, so it impacts forecasts every single day. And specific to a hurricane, it's huge. We can see that group of thunderstorms start right when it begins. Then we can track it. It's why we can give 10 days notice saying that a hurricane is coming. So a satellite is imperative to everything we do. Um, radar, once it gets closer to land, and I have this little thing with my producers, a lot of times they think we're looking at satellite, but it's, uh, it's radar <laughs> by the time it gets, they get them confused. They're easy to get confused. A satellite is up in space looking at the whole Earth, so that's the thing that's going to see it over the ocean. When it gets closer to land, the radar is also imperative. And it's so critical to how we forecast the outer bands of the hurricane, where the tornadoes are going to form, where that friction is going to move, and where the circulations are going to end up being. That's what the radar can see, because the radar works kind of like, I always say, like how sonar in a bat, they can see without seeing. They're, they're sending out that wave. It's coming back and saying, hey, there's a wall. Don't run into it. <laughs> the radar is that way, where it's sending out a radio wave. It's hitting the storm. It's coming back and saying, hey, meteorologist, there's a storm there. This is what it looks like. Awesome. Well, have you ever wondered what a hurricane looks like from outer space? Astronauts have an out-of-this-world view. Check it out. I'm joined by NASA astronaut Hoot Gibson. Hoot, thanks for talking with us today. I'm happy to be here. Tell us about the weather from space. Like, what could you see when you were in orbit? Of course, you could see everything when you were in orbit. And that's a good place to be looking at things like volcanic eruptions and hurricanes. And it turns out that every time I flew, there was a hurricane somewhere over the Earth, either in the Pacific Ocean or in the Atlantic Ocean, and either the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, depending on where it was summer uh, at that time. But each time I flew, there was a hurricane somewhere and it was fascinating to watch them. Now, we didn't get a lot of time to watch it, but we'd take photos of them as we went by because we're going five miles per second is our orbital speed. So we're gonna cross the whole expanse of a hurricane in just a matter of seconds. But we'd take lots of photos of them. The eye, as you might imagine, shows up very clearly uh, from orbit. And all of the huge spiral bands wrapping out from the eye full of tornadoes and thunderstorms and things, we could see those very clearly from orbit. Did it give you an appreciation of how much power is involved in a hurricane? Oh, absolutely. When you'd look at these things and they'd be several hundred miles across, you could just see how high they were reaching in the atmosphere and all of the embedded thunderstorms. Oh, it's incredible to see how many embedded thunderstorms there are in a hurricane. Awesome, thanks for talking with us. Uh, good to be here. Ginger, why did you want to become a meteorologist? I fell in love with the atmosphere at a very young age. Um, I had a cottage on Lake Michigan. My brother and I were playing outside. It was a very stormy pattern that we were in that summer. I didn't know that at the time. I was eight. Um, and we're watching, and the thunderstorm's moving across the lake. It's like being in the plains and being able to see thunderstorms from miles and miles away, to see their power, to see the energy. That summer, we saw water spouts. We saw lightning hitting the lake. We saw some of the most awe-inspiring images that storms can give you and then when they were close enough my mom would freak out we'd run upstairs <laughs> and everybody would be and I'd kind of be still staring out the window I found myself so entranced and um, really enamored with what the atmosphere and the power of our earth was able to do so from that point forward I went and grabbed the encyclopedia in third grade that was like Google but books <laughs> and I had you know flip to the weather section flip to the tornado section I needed to know more and so I love and still love my favorite part about it is the puzzle that is the atmosphere and putting that puzzle together. 
If a middle school student wanted to become the next Ginger Z, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? I would say just if you find yourself doing that, that's a good start. Uh, I think you have to have the real passion. You have to have the interest. I still, when I walk out every day in Times Square, it's harder to see the sky, <laughs> but I do look up to see what, what type of cloud is there. I have that in me. It's never going to go away. So that hobby or whatever you would call it, the thing about me that is, is a little unique, um, take that uniqueness and drive it forward. And then if you want to come into broadcasting, I don't know that I have great advice because <laughs> I didn't study broadcasting. Uh, I actually just studied meteorology. I had, if you fast forward from my love of the thunderstorms on the lake, I, through high school there was a derecho that came through, a big windstorm, and that really emphasized how much it hit humans because it was impacting all the people around me. My movie theater was wrecked. I mean, it was, it was big. And they, I took that and then Twister came out and I said, oh, Helen Hunt's character, a woman who's chasing storms, I'm going to be that. And I went and took all of those moments and didn't listen to what everybody else said because they said well that's the craziest thing I've ever heard I went and found a college that taught storm chasing and that's what I intended wow. to do and then I got there and then I did an internship with James Spann who's amazing and then all of a sudden I was on TV and you know 20 years later here I am doing Dancing with the Stars I don't know how this <laughs> happened <laughs> but I think it's all born of the love of science awesome you're very successful, but have you ever experienced failure and how'd you deal oh with it? Oh my gosh, I fail every single day. I'm a parent now. This is, this is like the name of the game. In my career, I've definitely had failures. I've had a lot of things on, on the daily basis that I have to, I have to get over myself, basically. You know, you have to, and what I end up doing, and my biggest piece of advice for kids always is, if you can say to yourself, will this matter tomorrow? Will this matter a week from now? If the answer is yes, then you can say, will it matter a year from now? If it's going to matter a year from now, you could put energy toward it. If it's not, you have to let it go. I wish I would have learned that a little bit earlier in my career, in my life. <laughs> um, I'm not expert at it, but it's a great practice to get yourself. It's like the best meditation that you can do. Well, it's not just here on Earth that we experience hurricanes. Let's take a look at some of these storms that are on Jupiter. I'm joined by Dr. Scott Bolton, Principal Investigator on the Juno Mission to Jupiter. Scott, thanks so much for talking with us today. Great to be here. Tell us about storms on Jupiter. So the storms on Jupiter, they're, they're actually similar to the Earth, but they're much, much more powerful. Um, the winds around the Great Red Spot are hundreds of miles an hour, you know, three, four times the fastest speed that we see here on the Earth. And the whole place is covered with storms. When you see the images from Juno, it's just amazing. In fact, one of the things that surprised us is when we saw the poles, they were covered with giant polar cyclones. And these are cyclones that are, I mean, they're nearly, you know, a significant fraction the size of the Earth. The, the Great Red Spot's bigger than the Earth. So everything about Jupiter's on steroids, including the storms. Why is it important that we study storms on another planet? So one of the things that's probably the most powerful tool for scientific investigation is comparative study. And so when you study another planet and you learn about how its atmospheric dynamics work, how its weather works, how meteorology storms, you start to compare what's similar to that of the Earth, what's different. And when you want to make a general theory that basically has to understand, it has to be able to explain Jupiter, has to be able to explain Mars, Earth, that's really where the power of comparative study comes in is, is in order to allow us to come up with the theory and the physics of how nature works that works everywhere that we see. How can a middle school student get involved with the Juno mission? So one of the best ways to get involved is just go to our website, missionjuno.com, and there you can actually get involved in not only looking at the images and the data that we have, but you can actually analyze and make your own images from our raw data. You can customize a picture you already see that somebody else made, or you can actually go into the raw data, see how that camera works, and make an image from digital data that's being sent down by our spacecraft to Earth. Awesome, well thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. We've talked a lot about hurricanes today. You're an expert on hurricanes, you've been inside hurricanes. Are they getting bigger and more powerful? I think within the science that we know and the climate scientists, because that's an entire specialist uh, that you'd have to speak to, but from what I've been in and from what I know from the research I've read, more heat, more water vapor, stronger storm. So yes, I think the bottom answer is yes. What I have witnessed is our impact. Our building in a non-sustainable way has had a giant impact on how storms react and how we react to storms. When you put a bunch of concrete where there used to be a wetland, it is not going to flood the same way. And I think that's the lesson that 
in the now we can take that that's something we need to watch, how we build, where we build, and what we're doing going forward to our planet. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank we you. Appreciate Thank it. you both so much for coming. And you know what? I've got a lot of forecasting to do, so I'm going to have to leave you. <laughs> got the whole world to look at. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you were right. You were both. We've had a great trip to New York, and we hope that you've learned a lot about hurricanes. We want to thank our guest, Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, for joining us, and we want to remind you that next week we'll have a mission debrief. We'll have an expert from the Capital Weather Gang joining us, answering all of your questions about hurricanes and anything you want to know about weather. Get us those questions. Send them via Twitter, Facebook, email them. As a matter of fact, if you can get that question on a billboard here in Times Square, we'll take that too. We'd like to thank Boeing for sponsoring our show today. And we hate to rain on your parade, but it's time for us to go. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.